As I was introduced, I'm Courtney Bowman. I lead uh, Palantir Technologies Privacy and Civil Liberties Engineering Team. Um, uh, we work in a number of different domains, uh, one of them being law enforcement. Um, and so I want to give a, a kind of a practical case study uh, in some of the issues that we contend with in working with our customers uh, in, in uh, policing. Um, uh, so very quickly, what, what Palantir essentially is, and there's a lot of text here, we're a data integration and analysis company. Um, we work with institutions like law enforcement agencies that have a lot of different data in different formats. Uh, and we give them the tools to do this very unsexy problem of merging those information sources to which they already have access into a common environment where they can make sense of that data in a meaningful way and interrogate it, ask conceptual questions against that data, and then draw analytical conclusions that are consistent with their remit as organizations. What we don't do is direct data collection. We work with data sources that, uh, that organizations have, have already access to. Uh, we don't do data reselling. We don't centralize all uh, law enforcement agencies' data in, a, in any one place. Um, our, all of our law enforcement deployments are standalone instances. Um, and our exclusive focus isn't on predictive policing. It's on a range of issues in policing. But I want to draw out the spectrum of, of uh, policing. Um, I'm going to skip through this presentation uh, because uh, I think there's, a, there's a, a lot of interesting focus on uh, various applications of data to various types of, of work that police do. Um, I just came from a conference uh, uh, that was focused on privacy issues, and there was a talk on predictive policing um, uh, from an academic who was very unfortunate because the first half of the talk was a synopsis of minority report. Um, and then the latter half was, I, I kid you not, the latter half was a mischaracterization of the work that's being done in the Chicago model uh, on evaluating vulnerable communities. So I, I want to draw out a couple of issues that, um, that I think will hopefully demystify some of the applications of how predictive technology um, is used and differentiate it from other applications in law enforcement use of another jargony term, big data and data analytics. Um, so when I say data integration, dealing with common law enforcement data sources, these are all things that law enforcement agencies have access to uh, in the course of their normal operations. Uh, things like calls for service all the way through warrant returns that are produced through legal process. Uh, and essentially what, uh, what our software platforms do is take those um, many different data sources and translate them into uh, object representations that analysts can make sense of. Um, this allows you to do a lot of different things, starting with basic forensic investigative capabilities. So these are human-driven analysis workflows, being able to draw out connections amongst disparate data sources and explore how people may have been involved in, in, uh, in uh, historical events or in investigations that are currently underway based off of information that's already been identified. You can move to more advanced applications like social network analysis. So this is applying things like social graph theory to understand the networks and hierarchies of criminal organizations and use that for very various law enforcement purposes. Um, you move to more uh, uh, advanced analytics that get closer to the inferential end of the spectrum. So for example, hotspot analysis, uh, as Jeff Brannigan mentioned, is a method for identifying historical trends, but it isn't necessarily suggestive. It may be suggestive of future events, but it isn't necessarily predictive in the way that predpol and predictive uh, policing are. Um, uh, and then there's intervention analytics, which are a type of, of analytics that focus on looking at identifying potential, for example, members of, of vulnerable communities. Um, so there's a theory that I mentioned before that was, that was built into the Chicago model, um, looking at uh, the propensity for prior uh, individuals who are associated with victims of, of prior uh, violent crimes like homicides and their likelihood to be the next victims or perpetrators of, of certain crimes. Um, so there's a, a number of techniques for, uh, for building out social graphs to be able to identify these connections and then focus on social interventions but also mitigation strategies that can be applied to those approaches. Um, things like uh, ensuring that decision making goes through human review, that there are audit analytics in place, um, and that uh, access to the, to the data and workflows is consistent with organizational uh, uh, restrictions.
Um, and then predictive analytics. Um, this, there's a, a number of, of uh, issues in predictive analytics, um, but, but uh, a few things that I want to draw out, um, things that we focus on uh, as, as a company in terms of implementing predictive regimes uh, with our customers, and again, this is a very narrow area of work that we do. Um, we emphasize the, cr the critical fact, and I'm just going to jump ahead uh, to the final challenges in guiding questions, because I think this is the, the crux of, of, uh, of what I think is useful for the discussion for today. Um, the, the challenges here are, are questions of efficacy. Um, is the, the, the analytical regime that you're working with, uh, is it actually producing empirically viable results that you can point to and say, this actually makes sense? Uh, it's actually producing meaningful results. Um, scope is a, is a critical uh, factor as well, ensuring that the, the data and the applications uh, for which you're applying that data um, actually make sense and produces uh, uh, analytical outcomes or predictions um, that, that can be applied in a meaningful way. Causality is important, particularly uh, to the ends of being able to uh, uh, respond to uh, criticisms, uh, uh, public redress, um, and to speak to the, the analytical product in the court of law, um, being able to tell a causal story about why the analytical results or the predictions coming out of your predictive model um, are actually meaningful. Um, disparate impact, addressing this question of are your predictive, uh, your predictive models um, reinforcing uh, discriminatory outcomes um, either through uh, direct application of sensitive categories or through proxy measures. Um, human review and decision making, ensuring that the, you have this human computer symbiosis element to be able to ensure that human analysts are, um, are reviewing content and asserting before you actually go out in the field and make an arrest or um, uh, perform some other law enforcement uh, uh, activity. Uh, constitutionality gets into Fourth Amendment jurisprudence questions. Um, transparency, a critical element of being able to speak to the value of the algorithm and, uh, and have results that you, can, uh, that you can defend. And finally, uh, policies and procedures, ensuring that institutions engage with the community and represent how these systems are being used and have documentation uh, so that uh, questions can be addressed. Um, so thank you all.